Good evening, everyone. Buenas noches. Boa noite. Welcome todos, todes, todas, everyone, to El Museo's uh, panel discussion tonight, uh, curating during the pandemic. Uh, it is my privilege and pleasure to be joined by esteemed colleagues tonight here. Uh, Hitomi Iwasaki from the Queen's Art Museum, Aime Iglesias Lukin from the American Society in Manhattan, and Herb Tan Tam from the Museum of Chinese in America in Manhattan downtown. So thank you so much, my co-speakers tonight. It is a true privilege to welcome you as a co-speakers uh, for the panel this evening. Thanks everyone who's uh, joining us at this time. I hope you enjoy. This is uh, just a couple of remarks before I pass the word to Aime to acknowledge the fact that the museum is opening its first online exhibition ever tonight, Popular Painters and Other Visionaries, that is in the uh, digital platform live starting today. I had the privilege to curate that show and I will share more about it in a, in a, in a few moments. Uh, so I wanted to just acknowledge that briefly. Uh, we'll be sharing the link on the chat box so you guys can join from home and hopefully uh, share your impressions later. There will be other programs around that exhibition and others in the near future. Uh, but for tonight, I would like to uh, start our panel and asking uh, Aimé to start leading the conversation. Thank you very much another time. Thank you very much, Rodrigo, for the invitation, and thank you to all the participants and to El Museo for having me. It's um, an honor to be uh, moderating this panel. And just to give some context to our audiences, we, you know, uh, when Rodrigo invited me um, to celebrate the occasion of uh, the opening of his exhibition, uh, he wanted us to try to talk what it means to be curating during the pandemic which is a topic that I think we're all learning about uh, while we're doing it and doing our best effort um, to try to create an interesting experience for our audiences online, the same way that we try to do it in person. But uh, one of the questions that I hope we can address today is to which degree can we reproduce the in-person experience in a digital format? And something that we were actually just commenting is um, if on the contrary, this experience is gonna allow us to rethink um, the idea of the digital, not as something that is complementing or trying to reproduce the um, uh, in-person experience, but something different and something that uh, will continue to take place uh, later on. Um, so that's one of the questions. I mean, how much can we reproduce? What new ways of uh, knowledge or questions and of sharing art we can offer through these new platforms and these new ways of promoting art and how much is probably going to last uh, after the shutdown is over, which we all hope will be over soon. Um, also, as part of that same, you know, topic to which degree, you know, uh, the fact that, you know, possibilities for social gathering and for community forming which are so important to contemporary museums and specifically to the museums, you know, reunited today, um, can be, you know, can, can, how can we still create community in these digital scenarios? Um, and then um, in parallel to that, um, something to have in mind and that some of the speakers are gonna discuss is um, the, the new relevance or possibilities of public and outdoor art uh, uh, and how, you know, uh, this type of uh, public uh, outdoor uh, pieces can gain new relevance and transcend the, the limit of the museum, a limit that 
is now exacerbated, but they shut down, but that existed before because, you know, the institution museum is an institution that we are trying to rethink and that we are trying to open, but that has, you know, since the deception being very elitist. So we're trying to go beyond that. Um, and then uh, finally, um, you know, uh, how, what, what is the, you know, the, the, what is the importance of making these efforts in this time in which, you know, it's hard to reunite in person and it's hard to, you know, to have people get together in the museum and how can we help people get together beyond the museum? So with that, just to give some context and some of the topics that we're trying to address, uh, we're going to have first Rodrigo, then Herb, and later Hitomi present on experiences of their own institutions and how they're trying to deal with this. So I'm going to pass the word to Rodrigo. Thank you, uh, Amy. Uh, so I, I would like to start maybe by giving a quick overview about how the, the pandemics caught us at El Museo, right? So basically I was installing a show on Friday 13th. We, know, we knew the possibility of the museum uh, closing its door and that show would, would open 10 days later. And that would be my first show at El Museo, both curate, whether curating or programming. And that is a very important exhibition. It's the Taller Boricua uh, sort of historical uh, exhibition that I'm curating as my first show here, Taller Boricua Political Print Shop in New York. So on that day, that Friday 13th, I remember that I woke up very early in the morning and I wrote an email to my several friends in the art world, inviting them to the opening that will take place in a few days. And then I came to the museum and we closed the museum. And that was, I mean, of course we knew this could happen, but of course we all remember how abrupt and how traumatic that was, right? To everyone, I mean, the whole uh, safety situation and everything we experienced being in New York, that really brought a new urgency to everyone's work. I think that's, common to everyone that we really wanted to re-encounter, to reconnect to an urgency to everyone's work. So very well, I thought that was really important to, to stay disciplined, to stay, uh, to really stay on track to some things we were already doing, right? So I thought that there were several opportunities there and I want to give it like a shout out to everyone at El Museo's team in terms of responding really quickly to that situation and creating, especially the communication and marketing, to create an all-encompassing programmatic uh, platform called El Museo in Casa, really responding to this new concept that every institution had uh, uh, arrived at the same time to the same point of this sort of home service, right? Home, like in home video, home delivery. Now we have the home museum and that is a, a, new, a new endeavor, I think, for everyone, right? To reflect upon and to, and to curate for, right? So, the question is that for me, I don't know if everyone wants to have a museum at home. So that's, uh, that's, that's an interesting question that I don't think uh, I wanted to exhaust. I wanna keep brief to, the, to, to my, my, keep my presentation brief. But I think this is, a, this is an interesting uh, question to think of, right? So, but in any, in any ways, it was really, interesting to see how different institution was reacting and in terms of the in terms of the program that we were creating here at El Museo there was one project that really soon I realized that we would be impossible to to complete or to achieve as originally conceived 
and there was uh, an exhibition titled uh, Popular Painters. And then the show up, the title of the show that I was working around was Popular Painters, a, um, modern, phenom a modern phenomenon in the Americas, right? So I was interested that build around several show. I was shows I was curating in Brazil before just moving to New York at MASP, which was my former institution as an adjunct curator of Brazilian art, where we were really doing a big effort of reconsidering several artists and trying to reposition them. There are several artists that were working specifically in the mid-century in Brazil, in the margins of modernism, working with popular sources. So the first of the show was not like a self-taught, Artist, but was Portunari, who's a big household name in Brazil, considered by many an official artist, working the, from the 30s to the 50s, especially. Very big name, MoMA show in 1950. So very well, we did a show only about his popular sources. And then we moved on and did two other shows with uh, two other artists, Janira da Motta Silva and Agostinho Batista de Freitas, they were, you know, considered primitive painters or naive painters, and we wanted to really depose those terms for good and to really understand how they did play a major role in how modernity was reinterpreted in uh, Brazil. So with that, I want to share my screen. So basically, I was, I was thinking a lot about this show because when I started to study the museum collection, I was very pleased and surprised to find different collection clusters and nucleus and major donations that were done in the past. Especially there was one fund, a major donation by art historian and a collector Barbara Duncan uh, made by their children after she passed with several Brazilian, but not only Brazilian painters, Latin American painters from other countries also working outside the canon and being considered during their time naive or primitive and so on. So then when I was you know, finalizing the checklist of that show, uh, that's when COVID happened and that's when we decided to go for the online version of it. So for the online version of it, we really expanded drastically from, the, from the, that show that was of summer a small collection summer show that I thought it would have the, the potential to be expanded. And then this plat we created this platform. I collaborated with my team. A big thanks to everyone who supported me. In curatorial, Susanna Tempkin, Noel Valentin, especially who's our permanent collection manager, and Christine Santos. But then I started to incorporate. So the show is curated in eight sections. I want to go deep into them. So four of them are thematic sections around themes like labor and, um, and uh, Black Atlantic religions, uh, vernacular architecture, and uh, body representations. And four are more monograph presentations that are interspersed throughout the show. So we have one thematic section, and then the next section is uh, by another artist. And then see, here you start to see that I was, <clears throat> you know, there was also this major uh, donation made by the Seagulls, a family from New York a number of years ago of Haitian painters working around the Centre d'Art in, in Port-au-Prince in the 40s, 50s and 60s, 60s especially. And I started to create these narratives around uh, them also integrating with loans. So this is, for instance, a Horace Pippin that came from, uh, that came, I mean, the, the, the image came from the Philips collection that were uh, kindly uh, giving us permission to use the, the show. So we incorporate this several virtual loans and with that, I want to say that I think this is the really specificity of this. Of course, there's the collection. There's like several 
Puerto Rican artists in the diaspora that were also integrated in the collection and you know several years ago that are put in dialogue with other artists but i want to say that this using this idea of the popular painter and other visionaries that's the you know that's the second part of the title that i added later on in order to include people like felipe jesus gonsalves who's a cuban american emigre who created this uh, fantastic body of collage works in uh, mid-century from the 30s, 40s, and 50s in Philadelphia. So I think this is the kind of show that only El Museo del Barrio could do, you know, to really have this Pan-American inter-hemispheric conversation going on with the Caribbean really playing a major role with it within with the with the Haitian uh, painters right that are I mean presented in several sections we see here for instance utopias in the margins this is this is the section where I'm dealing with uh, vernacular architecture uh, but also the idea of utopia as represented in the works like Azilia Guilen, this is a wonderful painter. She's a Nicaraguan painter who was active in um, who was she, she was active in uh, in Nicaragua, but she showed a lot in the States in the uh, OAS Art Museum. And this is like this fabulous painting where she represents the artist sort of taking over the American the Pan American Union and this procession of uh, he, national heroes. So this is like this utopian vision that is uh, sort of prefacing this section together with a uh, Haitian painter Prefet Dufault. But I, I don't want to go so much deep into the into the platform today. But just say that this is this. I think that we were having this conversation a moment ago uh, before opening with Hitomi, and this is something that I uh, wanted to also mention, you know, when we have the chance to, you know, talk among each other in a minute, how, you know, like major international shows have been only the privilege of very privileged institutions to be able to, to do so. I mean, at El Museo, we have fabulous experience together with several institutions in New York, the Caribbean, uh, art in the crossroads, uh, of the world that show was maybe 10 years ago. I don't have the date uh, offhand, but I think it was 2010 or 11. Uh, but I mean, these are shows that happen once in a while, you know, once in, in every several years. So I think this is the redistribution of forces. That's something that's very important. And also, I wanted to also mention that La Trianal, the other show that we were working uh, on, I'm co-curating, this is like a spin-off of the traditional survey of uh, emerging Latin American art in the US that the museum used to do the S-Files. So we turned it into a, a nationwide research triennial show. And that show is also now being reconceived for, uh, for, for online, and we started five different commissioned uh, uh, artists, uh, online artist projects, starting with uh, Lisania Cruz and the obituaries for, of the American Dream that just premiered a couple of weeks ago and is live now. And we really selected these five artists to create works online, thinking in different strategies right being live performance using zoom or a crowdsourced generated uh, platform with lasagna or people exploring video animation like michael manchaka or like a participatory survey online about race by collective magpie uh, and a photo archive by Jime, uh, Ugas, which is the fifth artist. So this 
platforms will be launched throughout uh, the, the coming months until October, and the show will open hopefully in March. So I just wanted to mention that, you know, that when we were finalizing Popular Painters, I had this walk through with the educators, and I was really thinking, I mean, what is this? This is like just, it's just a presentation of a show, right? That I do this show, hopefully, in the museum in two, three years, maybe, maybe with a partner institution with common interests around rewriting modernism from the margins. I was thinking about it. And then I had the walk through with the educators and the way they responded to different aspects of the show. And they started to share ideas for like lesson plans and for, for how to appropriate from that really made me think of like, no, no, this is, it is an exhibition, right? So it's, it doesn't substitute, I think, in the, the experience of being together with artworks. I don't think that's really possible to be replaced, but it's, it's an exhibition of sorts, right? So with that, I, will, I want to, uh, to leave you with this uh, few projects that we're doing here, and there's much more that is part of El Museo in Tukaza, but this is my curatory perspective, and I hope we can uh, go back to some of these points in a minute. So thanks. Thank you, Rodrigo. And now we're gonna go to Herb. Uh, if you wanna start presenting, thank you so much, Herb. We're gonna be gathering questions uh, for a final Q&A and we can open for a general discussion with all the members. First of all, I just wanna thank um, everybody at El Museo and uh, especially Rodrigo for inviting me. Um, you know, uh, the exhibition that you just talked about, Rodrigo, is really, uh, amazing feat to pull off and uh, uh, I kind of feel sort of embarrassed and uh, a little bit like a slacker for not having done uh, uh, something like that. It's a great achievement. Um, anyway, I wanna, um, I'm not gonna share anything. I'm not gonna um, have a screen um, um, shared with y'all. Uh, I'm just gonna talk about uh, kind of what we've been going through um, as a museum and what in our department and the curatorial department. Uh, it's been like the last um, few months. Um, I realize some of you may not uh, have heard of the museum, may not have been to the museum that I work at, but um, uh, we're very similar right, in a lot of ways to El Museo. Uh, we're located down in um, Chinatown, Manhattan. Uh, we were started by community members um, who thought that the neighborhood deserved a museum. and that our uh, stories weren't being documented, they weren't being told um, uh, or incorporated into, you know, larger uh, stories of uh, American history um, and American culture. So the uh, museum began in 1980 and we're, we're essentially a social history museum, but we show a lot of art. Um, and I come from an art background. So, um, you know, uh, our exhibitions um, sort of mix a lot of art with historical um, themes. Um, so in terms of um, the coronavirus and, and, and curating, um, just to sort of give you a little timeline of what happened with us um, as, as Rodrigo did. Um, so we closed March 13th. Um, that was our last day in the office. Um, and I was there I was the last one there, so I was I was sort of assigned with putting up a, a sign at the door that told you know anybody passing by that we're we're closed. And I remember uh, typing it out, and um, we we're kind of debating like how you know when should we say we be open? And uh, we decided that we'd say that we'd be closed for the next two weeks. Um, and that seemed like a good idea, you know, like to sort of uh, not scare people that we have this sort of uh, sort of undefined time um, that we'd be shut down. So we, I wrote to, you know, we, we'd be open back again in something like March 27th or something. Um, and then, you know, quickly after a week or so, it became clear, you know, there's going to be a lot longer um, of um, an event timeline. So, um, but, you know, in Chinatown, actually, like prior to um, mid-March when the whole city shut down and when the stay-at-home order um, 
was put into place, <clears throat> Chinatown had already been uh, greatly affected. Like the Chinese community in, in New York was, had already been feeling the impact of COVID um, for several months. Um, businesses, you know, in the neighborhood were like reporting 40, 50% declines in businesses since uh, January. And um, a lot of organizations in our neighborhood uh, were canceling events around Lunar New Year, around the beginning of February. Um, you know, I think a lot of people were seeing what was happening in, in China here in those reports and then linking it with the Chinese community here. And there's a fear of coming to Chinatown and there's a fear within the community of um, uh, sort of the, of the same thing that, you know, they didn't want their event to be the one that was like spreading um, coronavirus. And even in our, in, uh, at our organization, we have a Lunar New Year festival every year. Um, has drawn like a thousand uh, people to the event on, on a single day. And um, we were debating back and forth whether we should cancel it or not cancel it. Um, we decided that we should keep it uh, on the calendar. And, uh, um, you know, needless to say, it was, it was a pretty sparsely attended event. Um, uh, and so that was February 1st. So again, like coronavirus, um, in our community is, was something that was, um, had a dramatic impact, um, even before the shutdown. So, uh, internally, um, with, with the museum and with my department, specifically the, the exhibitions department, um, we were planning to open an exhibition in April. Uh, it was an exhibition about, um, an art collective that was active in the nineties. And as a show we've been working on um, for a couple of years and we're really like excited about it. Um, and in, uh, in late March, we decided, okay, there's no way we could open the show in April. And we decided to postpone it. Um, and again, like postponing it, it's like, okay, till when? And we thought the safest thing to do was to, to try to open it in mid October. Um, and again, like, just like that, you know, two week uh, date we put on the the um, the poster we hung on the door. We thought an October fifteenth reschedule would be like totally safe. Um, but the more we got into summer, the uh, the more it became clear that you know any um, you know any work we uh, had to 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 um, to do, to install a show, to ship work, to, um, you know, even have a gathering of, uh, uh, of many people for, to celebrate an opening. Um, it, it would, it would be very different in this context. Um, and without a vaccine, um, you know, ready, we felt like October 15th was even um, no, too ambitious. So we decided to um, postpone it again. And the show had already been postponed like three other times. Um, so it was, uh, it, it was really like heartbreaking, frustrating to like inform the artists again that, you know, we, we would have to um, postpone it. Um, so in the beginning, like of the stay at home order, you know, our attention was really on what to do with the shows that we had planned and, and you know, try to inform people um, of what was happening, inform stakeholders, inform people participating in the ex exhibitions. Um, but, you know, also it felt to me like our department was sort of being sidelined, like the curator curatorial department at most museums are sort of like the, the focus in a lot of ways. Um, but during the state, during like, the, the shutdown, it felt like we, as a department, were um, kind of off to the side watching things happen on social media and, um, you know, having a lot of content turned over to uh, um, the digital platforms that we have. <clears throat> so for us, we were like, okay, we, you know, we, we have to kind of reinsert ourselves into the, into the, um, like, discourse of what's happening right now. And a lot of what was happening around us was anti-Asian racism. Um, and that was like, um, 
you know, a, a, um, that was something that was affecting a lot of people in our community. So we wanted to, to try to, even though we couldn't do um, physical activities, like we couldn't um, gather people, we still felt like it was important to have a discussion about it. So we decided to work with our um, education department to host like reading clubs um, that would try to help people, you know, um, think through and, and develop language for what we're going through right now and what, um, you know, how, how uh, xenophobia and racism is um, impacting our community. So, you know, that, that was something that we decided to start doing. And then George Floyd was killed, um, protests erupted, and, and uh, for us, the museum, we, we felt like we had to, um, there was even more of an urgency to um, be active for our community. And, you know, I remember in, the, in, in those early days of um, the protests, we were thinking, how, what, we sh what should we do in terms of releasing a statement? What should we do in terms of uh, creating more dialogue within our communities around things like allyship, um, like Asian American allyship with, uh, you know, Black Lives and the Black Lives Matter movement. And so that, um, you know, for, for several weeks became like this um, institutional focus. Um, and our reading club then got going and, and we picked up on some of the themes like, um, like around allyship. So, so it really had to take, it, it, for us it took like a real um, conscious effort to, um, to, to not think of ourselves as only people that make exhibitions, uh, but to think of ourselves as, as people that have something to say, period. And that, that um, we're also not experts at kind of what we're all facing. You know, we're not experts at being allies with, with um, the African-American community. Um, we're not experts at um, how to curate during a pandemic. Um, you know, we, we're just trying to figure it out. And, um, and we're, you know, right now we're trying to um, sort of force ourselves into these different roles so that we don't, as a department, become marginalized. Um, and so that, and, and for us, um, I think at the end of the day, we, we need to get back to making exhibitions. Um, and we're uh, getting into that more, um, getting into uh, ideas about how to activate the space um, of the museum without actually letting people in to the museum. So, um, because we still don't know when we're gonna reopen. Um, and that's, uh, the, 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 I think the great unknown for all museums right now. But um, for us, we're trying to see um, about how we can use the windows uh, of the museum to do exhibitions that are just very publicly accessible um, and also reflect on uh, what, what's happening around the museum, um, which are a lot of boarded up windows, a lot of art happening on the boarded up windows of Soho um, and a lot of messaging around like black lives, uh, um, black lives and, and around, um, you know, uh, racial justice. So that, you know, that's something that we're gonna try to, to uh, use as inspiration for what we're gonna do um, in the windows. And a lot of that is gonna come out of a lot of the material for the for the um, exhibition on the windows is going to come is going to come out of our collections, um, a lot of which is um, community history related, um, and a lot of it will be new material that's that's being collected now um, as part of um, a project called the One World uh, COVID nineteen collection, um, which uh, seeks to document um, sort of the impact of coronavirus on the Asian American um, community. So. Um, I think I'll leave it at that. I think there's a lot more to say and I'd rather kind of have a discussion amongst all of us, but, um, just wanted to give everybody a, a, a little window into like what it's been like, um, as we think through like curatorial work in, in, 
uh, at the museum. And I'll pass it back to uh, Ame. Thank you so much, Herb. Um, and thank you for sharing that with us. And now we go to Kitami. Hi, everyone. Um, I am so glad to have this opportunity to speak about um, situation. Thank you, Herb, for um, your, your, your situation being um, laid up. Um, and it, I know that you had a very peculiar situation with your community under this particular circumstance as much as you also literally go that your show is going to be soon open. I'm so glad to hear um, about um, we at the Queen's Museum um, in South Corona was also epicenter of the epicenter. Um, it feels like a long time ago by now, but um, it was such a reminder. So we've lost a lot of lives in our community. It was very acutely felt. Yes, it's the same story as Rodrigo and a herb that we closed the museum on the 13th and then not knowing for how long. Yes, that's all the same. Let me skip all that and let me get to the sort of a conclusion statement I prepared because I'm afraid that we go run out of time. And I do have some content to speak, but I can get lost in detail. So the in conclusion, I wanted to say something from Queen's Museum standpoint that we turn into the place where we really felt that community needed care. And I even went into a speak, studying the terminology of curate or conservator in French, that are what, what museum means in the community. What is the role of the museum? We, I'm sure everybody asked that question again, then again, but this is the time that you have to go back to that question once again. Um, and what it, what it means to curate the exhibition. And, um, and then that really comes down to what we're looking at and why we are doing this. And what, it, what is the exhibition or museum? What is, what is the function and role of it? We are creating an experience where something has to happen. And I think we are facing sort of crisis of humanity after the pandemic. And then, and then George Floyd killed. Um, we're seeing illness, illnesses of the society, which didn't didn't get created by pandemic. It existed all along. We're living with it all along. But it came to the point of us not being able to avert to our eyes nowhere. It's there, right there in your face. There's no escape. So that's that. I just wanted to uh, say this at the front so that I won't lose the opportunity to say this because, so what do we do? You as an art people, curator or museum administrator, what do you do? What is your position? What is your role? Um, I hope that I, in the end of my next five minutes, I can come to some kind of conclusion or some kind of our resolution. Um, so I am showing, sharing the uh, screen here. We've lost the same thing like uh, Harp did and Rodrigo did. Uh, we left the exhibition screen sharing. I haven't shared the screen yet, have I? Okay, I'm not succeeding in this. I'll keep talking while I try, but so we left the exhibition 2.5 weeks to go to the early April opening. We had a Dave, Bruce Davidson photography show. We had this group exhibition uh, called After the Plaster Foundation, Kama, or Where Can We Live? And another show is Ulrike Mueller's Gigantic Mural, and accompanied with that show in connection is Children's Drawing Show. Now we're going back to museum next week to pick up where we left off and complete the installation. It's been hibernating, it's been frozen. So the, uh, in the meantime, what have we done in four months? Yes, like any other museums, we delivered things like a museum at home, uh, home delivery thing. While we're discussing among ourselves, how many more online uh, studio visits do we need? How many more virtual exhibitions do we need? Uh, nonetheless, we went on. 
But the funny thing is, I'm not succeeding to screen share the screen. But um, what we did was, huh? Okay, what we did was online audio tour of Bruce Davidson show. Now it wasn't invented because of the situation it was there all along now we go yes yeah great um it was there all along um and it was planned but it just felt like it was um improvised but it was from 1961 to 1960 so this is this is the first ever audio tour we created at the museum and then this is Bruce Davidson. We all know he's a big photographer and, and magnum photographer. And the show was about photographs he's taken from 60s, 70s, 80s. But all of a sudden, the content, we focused on this show in conjunction with After the Pastor Foundation, which was about, which is about 12 artists, local and national. Uh, responding to the situation of real estate and an effect of capitalism. Um, and uh, roots, basically people having roots in New York City asking critical questions about a home and a property and the earth. Who has access to and asking who has access to these things under capitalism. This is the premise of the show and it, to accompany that show, we focused Bruce Davidson show to be also about the people crowding in New York. And we don't crowd New York anymore. We went through, after, after this, this show is frozen, we were looking at empty streets, empty plazas, and no one, no one, no one on the street situation out of window. Um, and then Black Lives Matter happens. Time of Change was a famous, uh, famous series by Bruce Davidson that he, he, as a white photographer, magnum photographer, he um, gained the trust of African-American population, people who were involved in civil rights movement, and he closely documented their footsteps. And the only one made it into the show is this small one. Again, this is the format limitation that we adapted, called a place called Gesso, and they allow us to make this audio tour with the images, but unfortunately, image is so small, as you can see. But this is one, only one image from the time of change in our collection of many others that we were able to include because this is the only one in New York City. I see from New York City, all else happened a lot outside of New York, as you know. So this is the um, lady who was born slave but survived all her years. And, and at the point of 1962, she was in New York City riding ferry. And then that's the picture of it. And in all these things, the empty street where people crowd in New York City um, become somewhat, this is 100th Street, East 100th Street, become relevant, uncanny relevant. Uh, under the circumstance we just went through, we came out of, I mean, not completely out of. The other thing I wanted to show is this online catalog or online content that after the Plaster Foundation or Where Can We Live exhibition. We, create, we had a model of traditional printed catalog at the point of um, close down. We shifted we reincarnated the contents and, and, and a concept prepared for the publication into this online content. This is a very dynamic thing, um, unless you may not have it in, in your hand as a physical book, but the content is very dynamic, including um, interactive um, uh, mechanism here, plus uh, curator Larissa Harris, um, conducted extensive interview with participating 12 artists and in that footage is here. This is a whole lot different experience and then this does not substitute for you to visit physical exhibition at the museum once show is completed. 
that's not a substitute and then that's not a surrogate. This is a completely another entity, but uh, this offers, this can only offer beyond visit of a physical exhibition, seeing artwork in person. And I believe this is one point I like to, I wanted to make that we discovered and we're forced to discover the real virtue and the beauty and advantage of online content. And I don't think this is going to disappear even once we open all the shows, however the limitation it may go through. I don't think this is going to disappear. And I think we were given the opportunity to discover and, and explore and extend the good positive aspect of talking about addressing art online. Now, I do believe in the old school way that art is something to be experienced um, in person. It, art is about experience and you can't skip that part. But there is online thing that uh, you can really explore and, and take advantage of. Um, so this is this is another, and again, all all this is about same thing: the social social injustice, um, inequity, by race or class or geography, or all that was exposed, and we've seen that in the past four months. Was it four? Yes, it's four. Um, and and in this content of the exhibition, premise of the exhibition becomes so somewhat uncannily relevant. It's like a zoomed in. Yes, we're doing this show as if we planned during the pandemic, but it isn't. And I like to think this is because that we're looking at what we're looking at, what was relevant before pandemic. And it's only the, 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 the it multiplied the urgency and the relevance was amplified because of the situation we've been going through. And then this is not something that a curatorial work under pandemic. This has been in place, but it has happened and this proving this to be relevant. Um, another thing I wanted to share on the screen is This is one of our uh, space inside a museum. And this is what's taking place weekly. This is a food pantry. The food insecurity is acute in our neighborhood. By doing this, with collaborating with local organization and um, functioning as we were offering space through the extensive work of our community organizer. We are one of the few museums started to have a community organizer on staff. And, and this is her work, connecting dots. And it's a very laborious, hard work to connecting dots and, and uh, enabling us to uh, be a supplier or the location of, of provider of up to thousand families per week. On one day, every Wednesday, we're providing food to the neighborhood. We're also working with census. Whenever we have this thing happening at the museum, the census people are having a table next to us at the door. And uh, New, York, New, York, New York City is having 50 some percentage of uh, response rate of census at the point. Um, corona, if you zoom into Queens, and you zoom further into South Corona, the percentage drops. And so we are trying to be part of this, encouraging people to sign up for census and, and, and respond to census. So that's another activity we're having. And I'm looking at the, I noticed I'm looking at the clock, it's 6.51. We should open up for conversation here to the audience. Yes, Amen. I don't know if I covered it well, but this is it. I think my time is up. No, I think that's great. And we can go back to some of this in the Q&A. Thank you so much, uh, Hitomi. Um, so um, I wanted to make a few comments, but before that, and um, very quickly, so that we can focus in a conversation, which is much more interesting. Uh, Rodrigo suggested I share a little bit of what we're doing at the America Society. So um, I'm gonna comment that um, very quickly. 
Uh, so um, I started um, this position very recently and we opened a show by Feliciano Centurion on February 13. So like um, most museums, uh, we try to put as much of the content of that exhibition online. Um, but that wasn't enough. Uh, we put the catalog, we put all the works, and we realized that wasn't enough. So we created a special series of um, people commenting on works in the show. And we invited not only other artists and curators, and Gabriel Perez Barreiro, the curator of the show, but also people that knew him, he, the, artist, um, the artist's sister. Um, so this is an artist that passed away in the 90s during the AIDS crisis. So it was important to, in a way, bring back his community, talking a little bit about community. Um, but the most important thing we've been doing, or if you want, the one like prompted and fueled by the pandemic was two series of uh, programs, public programs that we were planning to do already but that we very quickly turned digital and it worked pretty well and one is called um, in the studio and um, this is a program in which we're aiming to have uh, artists from all over the americas discussing their work so the idea was to replicate the situation of an in the, of, of a studio visit at the america society and we're doing that on instagram online and recording the conversations and that has been really really interesting um uh, that experiment, we already had uh, talks with more than 30 artists from all over the Americas. And we have, you know, a steady audio, you know, audience, but also it, it becomes an archive. And, you know, we were able to have artists from all over the continent, uh, to have artists, you know, to have a good balance of like female and male artists. Um, but um, we still have a lot of countries to cover, of course. There's always new territory to cover. Um, and then we also did, I want to be very brief, uh, we also did a series on architecture. And that was, uh, we're planning to do a series of talks, three or four talks a year with Laura gonzalez Fierro and Agustin Shang, trying to think ideas of space and architecture in the Americas. And that became a series of reflections through posts with um, architects and thinkers on architecture about ideas of, of space. And the contributions were super rich because it allowed uh, these guests to think about, you know, space in a moment in which space becomes such a determinant thing of everybody's life, right? Uh, so questions about uh, the life in the city, uh, questions about, you know, what it means to be inside, outside, and the in-between became central points of these uh, conversations. Um, but in a way, I think also um, something that's been guiding this conversation and that seems to appear all over um, our presentations is, you know, the idea of community and the idea of the global, right? And there has been this fantasy, uh, you know, basic, you know, timeline of history with, you know, the end of the cold world, you have the search of the internet and this fantasy of globalization, right? We were actually before the panel talking about global conceptualism, a show that happened at the Queens Museum. So we had this fantasy of uh, connectivity which, uh, as we all know, very, very quickly proved to be kind of, uh, you know, a chimera, you know, it's not something that necessarily uh, the excess of information, the excess of access to information means that you necessarily have more uh, accessibility to information and to, uh, and, and to provoke questions in the people accessing them. And I think it's very interesting what Hitomi brought up, which is the history of the word curating, right? Because curating is to heal, um, but also ever since the beginning, to curate is to organize, right? So we have a very special role, you know, uh, as and, and, and a very challenging and difficult one, trying to organize digital, an excessive amount of information that we have, you know, in 2020 on culture, you know, because museums don't talk about art anymore. They talk more broadly about culture, society, communities. And we have to organize it in a moment in which through the internet, everybody can access everything. And at the same time, you don't see 
anything, right? Because it's impossible to be, to, everything becomes anything very quickly. So um, I think, um, you know, that this challenge of making of online exhibitions is a very important one that probably to us curators is facing us to the roots of what we were supposed to be doing all along, right? I don't know what you feel about this. Yeah, I want to jump in right away and may I suggest that we do the same order as we did for the presentations. Uh, so I, I really want to thank Herb and Hitomi on uh, Museo's behalf on my, on my own, you know, personal note uh, for, the, for your presentations. They were super inspiring. And um, I just want to uh, share a few ideas with you, right? So, I mean, someone said earlier, there's no scape. And I think there's no scape. And I mean, in terms of, I mean, we have, the show must go on in a way. And, um, and Aime, you said now you're recapping uh, by saying that museums are, that curators are organizers. And Hitomi said that curators are healers, you know, from the, from the, the root of the word in, in Latin. Uh, to take care, right? To curate on that sense, and uh, and and you know we have several different iterations of this word. But also Herb said something that I thought was really interesting. He said, like the curator is someone who has something to tell, and I think storytelling is something really um, is something really key, right? So I think we we have to continue doing exhibitions online for the time we can. It's a little bit like uh, that this is the only thing we can do. I think we should do. I also took note of something here. I think the only more fatiguing thing than Zoom fatigue is, uh, than Zoom is Zoom fatigue talk, right? People complaining about going to Zoom and having so much. I think that's, uh, I think this is, that is, really wonderful work being done right now and I really wanna I really wanna say that uh, programs and projects and exhibitions such as the ones that we discussed here today they really have an impact in our community and they have the chance to really con keep the conversation going right I think that's really important that we keep the conversation going and that we're not, I think this is another thing. I think the art world was extremely, extremely lazy about digital presence. Very lazy. Mean, I mean, being for lack of resource, being for lack of uh, skills, being for just being lazy, right? So I think, you know, the art market somehow, people has been buying uh, art from PDFs for at least 12 years. So, you know, in, in online viewing rooms and such. But this is, this, is a, this is a tool that I think that museums can do much, much better. And I think this exhibition that I'm very, very happy to be launching here today and that I really uh, want to, you know, invite you for the next program we're doing around. Uh, I think this is, this is one possibility uh, of having something that is, or, or the Bruce Davidson that you shared, he told me, I think is really fascinating. And I think there's a hybrid, there's a hybrid nature to these things. I don't know if it's, I mean, they feel like books to me sometimes, you know. I deliberately call the parts of that show sometimes section, sometimes chapter, because sometimes I feel it's really like putting a book together, a catalog. So the show is its own catalog but I made sure there's a downloadable PDF there so people at least can take a checklist home uh, by the time they check out at the front desk. So this is, you know, this is all extremely inspiring. I think it's been very difficult times, horrible times in many ways. I think Hitomi, you said something that is really uh, key to this whole conversation is that this times really exposed the very perverse face of the society we live in, you know, in terms of the numbers of how the pandemics have affected the more disenfranchised one in this country. It's really something to be ashamed of, but it's no surprise. So I really think that with our work in the cultural institutions, you know, being aware of this and uh, 
in making sure the museum is a service of social justice, uh, but, you know, we, we can make a difference. So that's, I really want to know, finish my remarks on a, on a positive note. And I, uh, I welcome uh, our fellow uh, uh, participants in the audience tonight to share their questions and remarks on the chat box. And I think in May, uh, we'll share them with you in the 30 seconds we have remaining. But now with you, Herb, thank you. Um, yeah, I'm curious if, if people have questions. Um, and I just think it's a, it's a really um, important discussion for the future of uh, our work in, in, museum, in the museum world and in uh, the curatorial um, profession. Um, I think whenever things do get back to uh, what they kind of were like before, um, when we can gather and when we can, you know, um, uh, do physical exhibitions. Um, I think there's still gonna be um, uh, a sort of expectation that, you know, some of this content um, is available to people um, online. And I think, you know, like for us, we've seen a lot of people tune into our programs from all over the world. And that's been really interesting, it's very unexpected. Um, and I think uh, for, for the sake of that demand, I think um, it's important that we try to find ways to uh, make what we do, um, which we always thought about as like very um, uh, sort of pinned to a, to a location and to a specific space as inhabiting um, um, the virtual space that can be accessible, much more accessible than, than uh, what we're used to. Thank you, Domi. Um, um, yes. Um, yeah, the uh, so double, double pillars of, of, of virtual and physical. I think that um, smart use of online content and a virtual digital um, information would, should enhance the um, importance of physical encounter and experience of artwork when it's used right, and we should use it right. And I think that what's uh, we have a policy policy. We have we're really looking into we we've been known to be local, locally mindful museum, but we're going to be even more mindful and go hyper local. That's what we've been talking about. And then the care and repair is one of the keywords we have. Um, but at the same time, we're not ditching anywhere outside of Queens either. And then that's where digital gets in. And for example, we have a talk, we have a talk about the mentorship, mentorship um, program where local community, local artists, artistic community and organizations and whatnot being marched together. And we become a place for those merger to happen, interchange exchange to happen, where, and where we can also channel through, funnel through uh, international participants. And, and then that's, that's the contraction and expansion to be well balanced. That's the way we think we are going to move forward. And I think we are learning um, lessons, which is very useful and, and, and it should not be um, wasted this moment. Instead of thinking that we're suffering, we should take maximum of advantage of this learning opportunity and, 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 and then be able to Deflect in a positive way that uh, practice that we do of the um, connecting people and, and creating proper interface of art and a community in art and rest of the world. Thank you. Thank you. We got um, one question which is quite specific. Um, uh, by Shodi, do you think that museums will be able to allocate their budgets to accommodate a greater virtual profile given the extreme financial hardships to come? Um, 
I'm going to say that we don't know and that yes, we don't know how fundraising is going to look. That's my personal answer. Uh, how fundraising is going to look, it's going to be more important than ever. I think it's going to be important to be creative. I think it's going to be important to have the support of people who have the media to, you know, the medium to support. I think it's going to be important to create quality digital content and not just to create digital content per se. And I don't know if anybody has anybody else to say. Um, we had an earlier conversation offline uh, among us, but I think also this is a good opportunity to for us to really see how money is spent on art in the museum operation, and and then we should we should be um, frugal as frugal as possible. But it doesn't mean lack of international shipping uh, budget wouldn't should not be the reason for compromising exhibition. Absolutely. And I think, yeah. Absolutely. And then Lilia Tawada is asking, uh, how did each navigate supporting artists involved in your projects while reimagining the exhibition medium, supporting the artists as one community versus more general audiences as another, to which art organizations are responsive to? Um, uh, I can start responding that saying that giving work to artists, you know, organizing digital programs in which you pay them a fee is a way to support. I hear from some of the artists that we had in our programs that, you know, that little fee that we offer, you know, which we're giving the same fee for digital, you know, for for digital programs as we were giving for in-person programs um, made a little difference and that's important. Um, I feel um, that ideally an institution would have a connection in between its artists and its community, right? Uh, ideally, uh, an institution could help build that community also. So, yeah, I, I, I want to go back to the previous questions of just for a second in terms of this economy of the exhibitions, right? I think that's one thing that has been proved in terms of this whole global local friction that we're experiencing here which I think is very interesting. You know, I think this is, it's not one thing versus the other as like completely niched and separated. I don't think so. I think, you know, it's really, it's really this friction that is more uh, productive. And on that matter, I see that in terms of the program's reach, the digital is really, really bringing something new, right? Because we see, on this grid of people here, there's some people I know, some people I don't, but I see like a major location spread, you know, people from different places joining and in hopefully, you know, learning and bringing our experiences to their context and so on. So I think in terms of the economy, that's really interesting. I was really fascinated, I have to say, by these virtual loans that I came up with for this show. You know, I remember that Herb and he told me they created a group uh, for like curators on reopening. We've been discussing it. Then someone said, oh, but that's really cool because then you don't pay the shipment and don't pay the insurance. And then I say, yeah, but you don't get the painting either, right? But anyway, you get, the, you get, you get a reproduction of the painting. So I was thinking, you know, of new economies of the image, you know, like new economies of image circulation, I was going back even to uh, the Le Musée Imaginaire, you know, of, uh, of uh, the mid-century, this idea of Mario Pedrosa, the Brazilian critic, had an idea of a museum of reproductions. So I think, you know, this is, this is a very interesting possibility in terms of the economy specifically, because with, you know, it really allows you to increase your digital presence with something that is unique and is curated, is, is really crafted by curatorial research and curatorial narration. So I think, I think there's something to learn for, from this process in terms of the economic, of the circulation of means, of symbolical goods within the public sphere. You know, this is, this is how I want to answer that question about money or economy. 
Right, you guys, I'm just curious if um, in curating the the show, um, like you originally was conceived as being in the physical museum, but did, how how much of it changed because you knew that you couldn't do that? And, uh, it changed drastically because I had a checklist of thirty five works, and now I have over eighty. And I source from museums, galleries, private collections, you know, works that I know would make sense. And I added to the research and I gave it more, yeah. Uh, yeah, I gave it more space, right? I mean, with, with, except that there's no space at all, right? It's digital space. It is public space. That's, you know, that's, that's what I'm, I'm trying to say, you know, it is, we have to understand this as, as public space and um, and to you know to bring curatorial practice to bring critical thinking to bring our perspectives to that so. mm. it's sort of like uh, it sounds like you know whenever whenever like I do a show it's like the checklist starts out as like this huge thing mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? oh, yeah. and, and it's like this very hopeful thing um, yeah. and then like you know, no matter, like in every case, it gets whittled down to like 20% of what it was, uh, right? <laughs> it sounds like that's kind of what you're presenting is like this kind of like in an ideal world, like this would be the show, the, yeah. the, 80, the 80 paintings. I mean, for sure, there's more flexibility in these new walls, you know, sure. there's more flexibility. So am I hearing this right, uh, Rodrigo? You have a two version of the show? One in the museum. And no, I have no, no no version in the museum. I I hope to do like a, like a real in real life show in the future later, but right now it's only in the online. But I was planning it originally as a collection show. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think I I think if there's no other questions maybe i don't know do you guys have more questions from the speakers or a may do you want to wrap up somehow or because we we have a time a time limit also uh no no thank you rodrigo for inviting me and inviting us i thought the conversation was really great it was great to see what other museums are doing and try to think together collectively to create more community so thank you yeah, I mean, me too. I can't thank you enough. Uh, you, Tony, and Herb for being with us here tonight. It was really, really very interesting to me. I took several notes. I, I hope to continue the conversation. And I encourage everyone from our faithful audience to, you know, visit the Queen's Museum, the Museum of Chinese in America, and the American Society, and El Museo in our physical and virtual uh, locations. Uh, so just this, this, the exhibition was supported uh, gracias to the New York Community Trust Fund, New York uh, City COVID-19 Respo Response and Impact Fund. Uh, so thank you so much for supporting the exhibition. Uh, and um, want to invite you all for the 19th. Uh, be sure to join us with uh, La Trianal, Estamos Bien 2021 La Trianal exhibition program online. We will be presenting a performance by Poncili Creacion, who's a collective based out of uh, San Juan in Puerto Rico. And we commissioned them a new piece that they will premiere with us on the 19th of August. Uh, so that should be also uh, great. So I see you guys there. Thank you so much again, and have you all a wonderful night. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Rodrigo. Bye. Thank you, Amy. Bye, Barb. Bye, everyone. <laughs> <laughs>